Now, please welcome to the stage, Jason Kelly, leader of IBM Global Blockchain Services. Start with just a look at this thought of what we're talking about, supply chain. Remember this thought of supply chain because it's more of a value chain, more of a value chain that needs a capability, a value chain in an economy that's changed now because it's not just about one enterprise playing off another enterprise. Instead, it's turned into this thought of an ecosystem. Literally, we have governments, enterprises, and startups coming to us saying, how do we do something together? What can we solve together? What is it that we're going to do in this new economy of trust? This thought that I have to move faster in order to be more successful. And the only way to do that is to reach out to new partners because in a digital economy, whatever that word means, I love it when people say digital economy, have no idea what that means. But when it is digital, let's just assume that that means there's some technology involved and it's moving faster. And the only way to move faster in that digital world is not just making yourself faster, but to tie into others. So this thought of trusting and working together. And trust then becomes a valuable asset if you can have trust and if you can move quickly based on that. So with that, trust in what? Trust in just business, in the entities that you're working with? Not really. Still, in the middle of all that we do in business, there's data. And that's what's really all, uh, that's really what, what we're talking about when we say this new business and anyone talks about digital. Because at the center of everything that we've done, whether it's been services oriented architecture back in the day, or if it's big data and analytics, if it's cognitive, it's automation, IoT, they all rely on one thing that's data. Access to data. And then once you get that data, knowing that that data is exactly what it should be. So old problems are our current problems and will be the future problems because they will still revolve around that transfer of data, which is where the trust comes from. So when you think about this thing called blockchain, it's really not that complicated. It really is those two things I've mentioned that have always been elusive, trusted access, shared access, to that data, and then when you get it, you know that it's right, that it's absolutely high quality. That is the background, the capability, the outcome of this technology called blockchain, because that's really all it is. Now, <clears throat> while you see some examples, people say, well, this is new, and you're like, oh, this blockchain thing, it's so, it's not new. As Jerry mentioned, it's, it's, it's been one third of the time that it took HTTP IP or the internet to come to business readiness, which was three decades. This has been 10 years. So it's not new and it's not something that people are just experimenting with. Two thirds of all enterprises, and this is a global number, two thirds of all enterprises are already doing something with blockchain. That's real. And we'll talk about some of this, this, these things being real, and we'll have some, some, some real doers here on stage and not just a talking head, not just a talking bald head at that. Um, but we'll have some people out here to talk to you about what this really means. Now, that's the fun side of it. Oh, isn't this great? Everyone's using blockchain. I get to run around with a T-shirt. Blockchain, oh, it's great. You know. However, what's the risk? Is it really that easy? Blockchain is just the next bright, shiny thing. It's no different than any other technology that came out and everyone's doing it. But we know from some of the surveys we look at, GitHub, uh, now Microsoft, GitHub, along with Deloitte, did a study and they found that of, of the 26,000 projects through GitHub that were blockchain based just a year ago, only 8% of those are still up and running. Now, were there bad ideas? No, they, in fact, they were great ideas but they didn't have the wherewithal. They weren't pointed at something that was going to give an outcome, and so they get stalled. And so if you think of the highway of opportunity, there's a bunch of Ferraris and, 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 and wonderful uh, Bugattis, these fancy cars of ideas sitting there out of gas. 
because they didn't have the right focus, the right outcome they were running to. So is it hyped? Raise your hand if you think uh, blockchain's hyped. Oh, come on. You all should have, I've got it, I have it on my shirt. It's hyped. Good Lord, when, whenever you can put blockchain next to your company name and get a five points push on your stock price, good Lord, yes, it's hyped. It is hype. That's why you're here. It's exciting. But hype isn't really that bad if there's a reality on the other end. If you're really pointing that hype at something that's going to give you a business outcome. Now, some people uh, are, are saying it at the enterprise level and even in the startup saying, well, let's get in there and let's get this company. You know, I'm a startup. I'm going to jump in this company. We're going to do a, 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 a great POV or a POC. What's, what's a POC? Proof of concept. I say, oh, well, let me, let me do a POV, which is a proof of value. So why would we, if I said it's real, well, it's not conceptual, but we're going to do a proof of concept. You're going to deliver business value if you point out a business outcome, but we're going to do a pr proof of value, even though we know it's there. So one of our, our clients told me this, uh, she, CIO, uh, pulled me aside and said, Jason, we did this POC thing, we did a PO, POV. And then what we realized was we really did a POI. What's that? It's a proof of incompetence. Because in fact, they spent all of their budget doing the concept, doing the value. It was in the quarter, and they said, we got no money to actually do what we just proved we wanted to do. So it's real. It's now. It takes the ecosystem to make it happen. Forget about this bright, shiny word, and run to the outcomes. Run to the business outcomes. If you're talking to a client, our clients are saying, I don't want to talk technology anymore. You, this is a technology and business effort. It's very simple. It's one that just says, if there is this supply chain, back to where we started, think of it as a value chain. And know that there's a bunch of, bunch of handoffs along the way. And in those handoffs, there's an exchange of value. And right now, there's a lot of people in between each one of those exchanges of value. Every one of those handshakes that has to happen either adds value to the end product or it's taking value out because they're just brokering data. Back to my example of what blockchain is. And so the question is, are you adding value or really just extracting value? That's the question. Because in the end, all of this technology stuff, as it is now and as it will continue to evolve, really evolves around one outcome. That's all of us as consumers. That's it. That's the focus of all of this crazy technology. If you're adding value to that end customer, all we care about is, hey, do we trust that what we're getting is what we thought we were going to get? Is it of the right value? Is it of the right cost? Ultimately, it's my experience, your experience. If you're adding value there and you're able to do it in that system, then you should remain. So always keep that client in the end in your focus. That's what, what all of our clients are telling us. And do it around trust because we all trust. Jerry gave a great example of food. We all trust what we're getting. We're, how many people uh, eat organic food? Don't, again, don't be shy. Raise your hand. You know you do. You pay those extra couple dollars, right? Right? You all look fit. Fit Cleveland. That's not a joke. That was, <laughs> that was for, for real. Come on, man. I'm, a, I'm Ohioan. <laughs> O-H-I-O. Come on. Get in there. <laughs> so, so, okay, all of those hands that went up. Now, fun fact that comes out that we know through my friend Frank Giannis. There is more organic food consumed than is produced, <laughs> right? So that's the trust we're talking about with this client at the end, with the consumer. That is, in fact, where this is all going in this trust economy. And when you add value, you get a business return. So with that, I want to in, uh, ask out onto the stage a couple real doers that are adding value to their value chain. If I can have Steve and Vasanti come out from 
um, Kroger and also uh, PNG, two wonderful Ohio companies. I'd like for them to uh, join me on stage. And this way you, you really don't have to just listen to the talking head in front of you. <clears throat> and what I'd like to do is have all of you join us in a conversation about blockchain because I'm, I'm just the, the literally talking. What we have with Vasanti and, and Steve are two doers. They're leading their organizations with this new capability. So if I can, I'll, I'll start with Vasanti. Uh, Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at PNG. Thank you, Jason. Um, first of all, good morning and thanks for having us here. Um, we're really excited, uh, along with Steve here from Kroger, so we have some great partnership between the two companies, so, so this is great. So I'm Vasanti Chelasani. I've been with PNG 19 years. Um, so my role within PNG is twofold. Um, I actually lead what we call the next generation shade services. So global business services is the core of how we operate. We touch every different, you know, the live stream behind uh, PNG's work processes. And so what my team does is that we actually are a little bit of the, think about us as we're looking at what's ahead five years from now. How do we disrupt the day-to-day -to -day business today, bringing the challenges that's out there in the real world and the business and intercepting with the technology. So we actually, it's an incubation, but we also are working on real business problems and making sure that we can actually do the POC and, <laughs> and the POEs and everything else, but in the context of like what's agile methodology is going to be and how we can drive value within PNG. Thanks for something, Steve. Yeah, so I've been uh, with Kroger for about 10 years now. it would be 10 years in January. And I've spent my career there in the IT department. I'm a program manager. And uh, I got introduced to this blockchain notion when I was uh, working for the chief compliance officer, trying to, uh, to stand up our compliance approach for the Food Safety Modernization Act. So I kept hearing this uh, word called, uh, called, block, or called traceability. And uh, my enterprise architect said, hey, you, you need to look at this thing called blockchain. IBM keeps aggravating me, but it's just not getting any traction here. So why don't you see if you can do anything about it? So I spent a few months beating my head against the wall, finally got some, uh, some money to go play around with it. And about two days before I signed the uh, contract, the uh, CEO for Walmart called our CEO, and then he called our food safety VP, and he called me and he said, hey, you, have you heard about this blockchain thing? We need to do something with this. So all of a sudden, I was sitting there with two blockchain projects. All right, so I'm gonna stay with that. So I'm gonna run with that uh, uh, comment there, Stephen, because uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, this is prep for you, Vasan. I wanna know about your journey. So I know, uh, as you're saying, you know, you've got two blockchain projects that came out of that, but what about the business, the interlock with business? What has been your journey in this thought of this bright, shiny thing mm -hmm. called blockchain, some pain in the butt company called IBM bugging mm -hmm. you, forget those people. But let's talk about, what about this, this, this focus on the business and the outcomes? What's been your journey? Right, so uh, to me, that's key. Blockchain, you know, been, been in the IT department with a large company for, for a number of years now, and blockchain was really one of the easiest technologies that, that I've implemented. Um, my IT team was amazed, but what we found out was it's really about the business and it's about our data and it's about being able to share our data across uh, other companies. And what, what I tried to do was to align very tightly with our business partners because just having this technology out there didn't do anything for us. But what we needed to do was to be able to get our data from supply chain, from our manufacturing team, um, from loyalty, for instance, so we would know who, who bought each product and really bring that all together. And without the partnerships from those different, group, those different business groups, we had nothing. It was just a technology that sat there that, that added zero value for us. So it's really that, that thought of bringing together that ecosystem and the players. And I know, Vasanti, we've talked about that, this thought of, you know, it, it, it's not just one. We, we, we say often, I think we, we are, Jerry said, it's, you know, it's team sport. What's been your journey uh, within your company and, and how does that play out? 
Yeah, it's, to add to Steve's point, I think it's the, the implementation of technology was the easiest part, and then working with, with companies like you guys, I think you bought all of the technology that we needed. For us, the journey was a learning journey, um, to be transparent. So we started our journey about two years ago, um, really kind of dabbling into, if you really have to take this cool technology and make it work for a company like P&G, how do we think about it? So we actually worked through and looked at, you know, I mean, blockchain is not for everything, AI is not for everything, right? So we really started working with our business leaders that own the different streams of business within P&G to really understand what the pain points are currently for the business, right? Be it supply chain, you know, we're seeing some in media and so on. And then when we got those challenges coming into our labs, we really kind of put together and orchestrated and say, if we apply blockchain for this, what is the value and how is this going to work for us and how are we going to be implementing this? And it took us about, I think, a good 12 months, I would say, to get our first kind of our um, working. We call it pilot, but really it's not pilot. We're looking at APAC, um, which is a, a big market for us, um, in really implementing some of the work. So one of the work that we're doing currently um, p and likes four and three letter acronym words, so we call it Project GOAT, but really what it is is the Global Ocean um, and um, a trade And uh, we, today we have many different touch points, you know, speak about carriers, speak about uh, freight, freight um, in the middle and uh, talk about all the ports we have to touch. And in some of these uh, countries we go into, they're very small countries, we don't have a lot of systems, you know, we don't have a lot of transparency in looking and thinking through where is our, our, our um, carriers and our products, right, in this, in this ecosystem. So that was a first thing that we kind of went after and which was um, a great problem to have we had um, a really good ecosystem of different touch points that we can go after and really kind of think through and said, how do we bring the trust, the data, the transparency into the system so we can actually make this process automated, seamless, visible, and at the end of the day, you know, all of that back and forth that goes in, um, how do we think about it? The additional stuff that we put on it is what is in value for the partners in the ecosystem to play with PNG in this, right? I mean, this is one of those things that you can't just put a technology and expect everybody to do it. It's a big culture shift. It's the way you do the work, and it's you know opening up your house to somebody that wants to peek in, right? I mean, it's a lot of that stuff that comes together. So that and, thought, uh, I want to, I want to, because <laughs> I want to just open up your house. I was like, whoa, yeah, it sounds kind of personal. <laughs> But I, I like that because we talked about the economy of trust. Sure. And so that's calling out this thought of shared and trusted data access, which has been something that's elusive, as I mentioned. So that's what you've seen then. You're, you're yes. validating. You're saying that, yes, we've had to say, this is my house, and I'm going to let these, these vendors and, and others in my ecosystem peek in. But I don't want them, maybe I don't want them to see the bedroom because it's all messy. That's where I throw all my clothes. But they can see the living room because no one ever goes there. But that, and so that's what we're talking about. Yes. In and both it, cases. Mm -hmm. Right. So. And that's, that's the core part, right? I mean, if, if that trust is not there, that transparency is not there, you could have a cool technology and it's another hype in the, in the stuff. So from a PNG perspective, a lot of the time we spent on in our journey in the last, I would say, a good 12 to 18 months is really thinking through how do we bring the technology, where does it apply, how do we think about the ecosystem, what's in for everybody in this game, and making sure that it works for all of us. So um, it's been an interesting and learning journey, and I would tell you that we're not done and we're not claiming success, but I think we're pretty close um, in partnership with, with uh, some of the work that we're doing with IBM and TradeLens and Mercs to, to make sure that you know, we're on a great platform to be able to scale. Um, and it's, it's interesting, so Vasante, as you mentioned Trade Lens, and I'll, I'll make mention to the audience, you know, Trade Lens is a blockchain-based solution where the shipping containers and, and contents and all of the supply chain on the shipping side, in collaboration with Maersk, you're able to track those items right. uh, in that part of the supply chain, right. which is which is exciting, and you think of that being one network, that part of the supply chain, 
and then as you get to the, it's shipped, it's shipped, kind of that, that slide, bit, shipped to different points, and then it gets to the retail location, and what is shipped, whether it's green leafy vegetables that have to be safe, then we need to know that there's some assurance that in that, in that shipping, mm -hmm. that it was there. So that's the, the transparency right. with the shipping and with the, the, the food that comes out the other end. Yeah, that's the that's, visibility of where the product is in the entire process. But I think the value of what's in for everybody was the transparency of invoicing, right? So we were able to automate and be able to invoice there's no disputes. Today, you know, it sits in Port of Abu Dhabi. Who knows where it is and how many days it is, and we get a fine, and we don't have that visibility. Today, we can tell exactly where it's sitting in that port and how long it's been sitting, and, you know, when, so when we get fines, so, so it's very transparent. You, you can see it in, in near real time. It's happening in the supply Absolutely. chain. So that thought of dispute resolution is just dispute visibility now because it resolves yes. itself. So that's, that, that's exciting um, in that that then shrinks this time right. to get something resolved and that no longer holds right. up the, the supply chain. our partners, they get paid quicker. They get paid quicker, quicker get our cash faster. flow, back to the consumer. I get it maybe at a, at a more inexpensive price or maybe you get to sell it at a higher margin. <laughs> who knows who plays with that value? But what you've done is pull some of that, yes. that waste out of the system mm -hmm. and added some insurance. And as I hear this thought of, of, of invoicing, you know, I go, wait, invoicing, that's not supply chain, right? But that's the value chain part of exactly. it. Exactly. So this is where there's people who say, oh, I'm going to solve the big problems. I know a lot of startups say, oh, I want to figure out how I can put new tags on those big boxes. That are, it's like, look, if you can get into some of these back office, as people tend to think of, you can get into some of those processes. There's just as much yeah, opportunity. And here's the interesting part, right? We never even thought about the whole invoicing value mindset. So we went in automating the process and the transparency, and now we have all of this data. Why do we do paper invoice? We can actually digitize invoice. So, so we're working on a second endeavor um, with you guys as well, and really thinking about taking all of this data now to do e-invoicing, which is even more faster. So and by so introducing blockchain, blockchain wasn't the thing. It was a catalyst, and it brought other things. And, and, and as I hear it, you said something that, that I think highlights something that Steve brought out is technology, and we see this globally, but I want to hear your, your thoughts on this, Steve. Is we see on average technology is 10% of the challenge. It's just thought of the business process because now if I can see all these things uh, in, in real time and now the invoices aren't paper anymore, you know, it's like everyone's going, yay, because people process and paperwork is where we see. But if I can get rid of some of that effort, that means I can move faster. But the business isn't always ready to move that fast, right? That's right. Yeah, we, uh, we, we struggled with it. And I think the big catalyst for us was really compliance. Um, you look back to the week of Thanksgiving, there was a huge recall for, uh, for romaine lettuce. And the FDA didn't know where it came from. We didn't know where it came from. We just get a, a notice from the FDA saying, take all of it off your shelves. Um, that kind of thing is a big catalyst for a food retailer to, uh, to figure out how we can trace our food globally. And you know, there's an interesting byproduct with that. As you mentioned, you, know, you find out that something's been sitting on the dock for three days or five days or, or however long. Well, from our perspective, if it's produce and I can get it on the dock one day instead of four, that's an extra four days I can keep it on my shelves. So there's a much better chance that I don't have to, uh, to throw that product out. And zero hunger, zero waste is a, is a huge driver for us as we try to reduce waste as, as a company. And this is an enabler for us to, uh, to be able to keep food on our shelves longer and, and uh, available to our consumers. And, and that's, that's, that's a thought of it because then, you know, more time on shelf or more fresh time on shelf mm -hmm. gives the, the consumer an opportunity to buy it, you more opportunity to sell it. Yep. Um, so again, it's, it's delivering value. Absolutely. It's not just because the technology yeah. is cool. Now let's, 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 let's take a step further into not just the, the, the front end of it. Let's get into, you know, how does this work in enterprises? So there's companies in the audience and they're saying, okay, blockchain is, who, who, who owns that? I mean, how does that, uh, Vasanta, you tell me, because there's no blockchain office in everybody's <laughs> company right now that I know of, because I talk to them globally and there's no one, <laughs> since I'm the, 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 you know, they're not there, they're not wearing their t-shirts. So yeah. who, how's, it, how's it work? It's a great question. Um, 
I think like any new technology that you bring in, um, you need some focused organizational structure to be able to go work it. Because it's not, you can introduce something like this in a very mainstream organization and be able to roll and run with it. Um, so from a PNG perspective, we looked at it very strategically, like we do any other different technology areas. Um, what we do is that we bring it up into what we call the innovation, to, but we work very closely with our mainstream business leaders. We're asking them, what is your challenges? It's not like a cool, shiny toy that's out here and you just play with it and figure out, you know, do we hit the dart and we hit it in the center. Uh, versus we're really partnered with our key business stream leaders to understand what are your challenges and here's how we're going to solve it. Your business is not going to, to engage with you guys if it is not a business issue that you want to solve, you know, granted whatever technology it underlines. So I think it's very critical for the peer companies, I mean, if anything, we can share uh, between me and, uh, and Steve is that think about what is your area of focus, where you can really apply the technology, where you can actually bring the added value. Also keep in mind that when this becomes a mainstream and it becomes a solution that's going to go into the market, you need an organizational structure to take that beyond and make it mainstream as well. So that tight integration becomes a very critical part. And I mean, I work very closely with all of the peer vice presidents in the company um, that own these mainstream work, work processes, understanding the challenges, understanding when it takes off from innovation to mainstream what's required to sustain this, you know, how do they think about, you know, everything else and the ecosystem that needs to play with it. So as you're thinking through the, the technology play to the problem, think about the culture, think about the change that needs to happen to be able to sustain it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's never going to be able to stick like, you know, will be another thing in the corporate world and it, mm -hmm. it's done and it's gone. So I'm going to come back, Asante, uh, I want to, because I want to, hear some more about these peer companies or peer players, if we can call it, in the ecosystem. However, Steve, you said something about, you know, uh, uh, compliance, and it, it, it spurred the thought of governance. You know, what are you seeing? As this rolls out, there has to be a sense of, of governance. Here's this new capability, and it's governor, governance within your company, and also what about as you roll out and do other things with vendors and so forth? What's your, your thought on this, this component called governance? So, I uh, I think governance for us in the, in the food industry, to me, it's all about the consortium and the group that the blockchain is bringing together. Um, where our vice president is, uh, is retiring and I was briefing our new vice president that was incoming about the work that we've done with blockchain. And uh, when I was done, she seemed a little dubious and she said, do you, do you really think this is the, the right way to, to solve this problem? And, and what I told her was, look, to me, it's not about this technology called blockchain. To me, it's about Walmart and Kroger and Ahold and Tesco getting together as some of the largest food resellers and really being able to drive standards into the industry and banding together to make decisions that's gonna benefit not only us as companies, but our consumers in general. I mean, food safety is not a, uh, it's not a strategic advantage for a company. It, it's table stakes. You know, our, our consumers across the globe really need, need safety in, in the food chain, and I think we can achieve that through the consortium. That's where the governance comes from in my so mind. So this consortium thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna digress on the consortium, I'll come back to it, is this thought of team sport, as you said, it, it's, it's kinda odd. I, Walmart and Kroger working together, mm -hmm. I mean, Come on, that's, uh, that's like uh, that's like the Brands Buckeyes <laughs> and, and, and Wolverines coming together saying, let's work together. Yeah. Let's see how that works. Yeah. Can you imagine Trump and, and, and Obama holding each other? Oh, <laughs> this is great. This doesn't work like that, right? This right. is dogs and cats. How, how, does, how does that happen in convening a consortium? What, what does that mean? I, I'll go to you, Vasanti, and I'll come back to see. Yeah. So we... We have a probably a little bit different structure than you guys do, but for us, the partnership is important in this game. So we as p and cannot do blockchain and transparency and data and everything on our own. So it's critical for us to be able to bring in the people that we work within this ecosystem to be able to partner. What's in for them to be able to do this successfully? 
and then bringing them to share that trusted data. Because once you have all of this and it's trusted, it's, you know, in UK, you know, from a blockchain, it can be private, it can be public, whatever uh, the architecture we go into. But what's the advantage of doing that beyond PNG for them, right? So if I'm just talking with them and saying, oh, you gotta partner with me because blah, 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 and you're gonna be booking this for PNG, it just only costs so much, right? I think we have to show these guys and we have to teach them in the process as well. So for us the last couple months has been, how do we not only internally coach and train our company and our leaders to be thinking through where blockchain is, is a fit, it's also the partner ecosystem bringing them in because not everybody's in this journey, not everybody is where they should be, but a lot of effort, but that, um, that advantage point, that value point is important for everybody. And I was talking to somebody last night, it's like a barter system and you go way, way, way back, right? So you bring two things and you have to make sure there's a value for both the, both the parties in right. this game, right. then the value has to be um, you know, appropriate to be able to play in this thing. But when they play, when they bring in, doesn't matter your Walmart or your Kroger or your P&G or Unilever, whatever. But I think that that thing brings that ecosystem in so, as a value. So that value, we're back to the value and valued outcomes. You know, Steve, you, you, Kroger, wouldn't you just be guilty of saying, hey, we're Kroger, you want to you wanna work with us, uh, so you better get on the blockchain. That I mean, never happened. <laughs> that never happened. I mean, but realistically, sure. I mean, as, as we move forward with, uh, with traceability, it's going to become a standard for our industry. I, I don't think there's any question. And... Uh, and Walmart's already done that. They've, uh, they just announced a few weeks ago that all of their leafy green suppliers are gonna have to uh, get on blockchain by the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna be able to do business with them. And it, it's, where, it's where the industry's going. And we're better off, in my mind, partnering. Yes, we're competitors in many areas, but nobody wants to hurt a consumer. Yes. And that is, yeah. is really where the strength in our partnership is. Yeah, and it's a great point, Steve. I think at the end of all of this stuff, for any company, um, just like us, is the, what's the value for the consumer? Mm -hmm. So we can do everything, and I think, Jason, to your slide earlier that you were talking about, um, all this has to translate to a value proposition for the consumer, and they, either it's faster product on the shelf, is, it is um, cost, it is you know, the pricing strategy, whatever. I think that has to be the focus or you know, as we think through all of this stuff. So as we think through it, and we think about where this is going, uh, I'll, paint a picture and then ask each of you your, your opinion on it because you've kind of given the basis. You, you've mentioned consumer trade in, in one network, if we call this a, a network, with consumer trade and all the vendors. And then you, you take the other and you have transportation and trade. So you have in the middle the shippers and then all those vendors. And then if we were to introduce in a third trade instance, something that we're working with, we have what was seven, then became nine, now 13 major banks, also competitors in Europe, that have now started a trade financing network. And these are the Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Santander, Nordea, these banks that typically do compete, mm -hmm. but they're saying, look, if we work together and we give visibility amongst these small to medium-sized enterprises that need financing, we can get their products shipped to market shipped through the market with, with some other providers so that we can get to the consumer. So now you have three networks. So what we envision, and we thought it was going to be future, but the, the market's happening now, these networks of networks are coming together. Right. Because their vendors, that value chain isn't much different. They're all touching. So now these things are coming together. That starts to make your head hurt. That starts to say, now, uh, this, this isn't just about individual enterprise competing, they're, they're gonna have to match up to other enterprises and it will be these coalitions <laughs> coming together mm -hmm. based on data, based on a blockchain network that will bring in other capabilities of AI, analytics, IoT, right? So tell us, where, where do you see each of your, your projects, your, your, your business efforts going with blockchain? What's, what do we see uh, you know, a year or two out? So for me, um, blockchain's not what I'm doing. I'm doing traceability. Um, I'll be launching a uh, traceability program, it looks like, uh, at the beginning of 2019. And uh, we've done a, uh, a soft dive into what our, our value chain internally looks like from a traceability standpoint. And uh, we've identified some key areas where we really need to strengthen things. And that's what I'll be focusing on because it was really easy to stand up the blockchain 
it's really, really hard to get the data to work right. Yes. And I think that to me is gonna be companies' biggest challenges yep. as, uh, as this blockchain thing moves forward. It's really gonna enable companies to talk to each other and, and to automate contracts and to make, you know, make transactions move at lightning speed. But that only works if the data works. See, I, I, I love the f uh, how you started, and that's what, it's, I don't do blockchain, I do traceability. That's your outcome. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the big money here, because I think if people, well, we continue to see people walk in, and you can't walk around with a bucket of blockchain. Yeah. You know, oh, here, I'm, I'm going to sell you some blockchain. Yeah. It's not in there. You can't do it. It's got to be outcome. So where do you see, where's, where are you going with PNG? So from a PNG perspective, I think uh, with the first initiative that's going to be in market um, soon, we have a lot of interest and a lot of questions coming in across all business areas. So we're looking at, you know, what is the opportunity for media buy? Um, you know, PNG is a branding and marketing company, and we spend a lot of money there. So, you know, is there um, more transparency we can bring in? Of course, data has been, as we started talking through, data is a big challenge. Um, in that space. We are also looking at, you know, areas where like coupon fraud, um, you know, how do we bring more transparency of data, traceability, um, to Steve's point, um, to be able to drive that. You know, we spend a lot of money on couponing space as well. But we overwhelmingly get a lot of interest in the P2P world where this money transactions happening. Um, be it the transparency, be it less dispute. And so we have multiple different areas in that space we're looking at. Um, and uh, needless to say, supply chain is a, a prime spot. Um, you know, we get a lot of requests saying, hey, do you think you can solve this issue and be able to help us? And is blockchain the right technology? So we got multiple stuff that we're looking at at this point. But needless to say, we want to make sure that the right ecosystem is there. You know, it's not a blockchain, like you said, carry the block and insert the puzzle. But while we insert the puzzle, there's a value proposition at the end of the day, so. So lots of, of potential going forward. However, there's this, uh, this gap, because if you're just as, as you don't carry a bucket of blockchain, it takes talent yes. to get to where you all are headed. Lots of talent. Uh, talk me through, so what are some of your learnings? What are, where are you getting this talent? Where, where do you find that? How does that, how does that come about? So, yeah. Steve? Yeah, so for us, we're, uh, we're, we're moving pretty slow with that because our focus is more internally and getting our traceability network right. Um, but we've reached into some of our higher performing developers, for instance, and uh, they, they were very, very eager to, uh, to partner with me and, uh, and to work on this thing. So right now, we're, we, we haven't set up a shop or anything yet, but we're just pulling on, on some of our higher performers. It's, it's, it's funny you mention it because it just as yeah, we're four plus years into this, this journey ourselves, and now with nearly 100,000 players in our more than 400 thousand person organization, we have people who are trained or cert they're, they're certified, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're ready to go. Even though they're doing some other job, mm -hmm. they're like, sign me up, you know, put me in coach, put yeah. me in. I really, this blockchain thing is exciting because they mm -hmm. do see it. So I, I do see that, that thought of reskilling or moving mm -hmm. top talent over. Now, Fasante, what about your, your talent? <laughs> Yeah. Plan. So we, we're doing multiple things um, within PNG. You know, we don't have a blockchain organization, but we have what we call established blockchain COE, um, which is really kind of looking through what is the talent, what's what's required in this space. So um, I know there's a lot of universities and uh, startup companies in the in the audience as well. But uh, we, as we bring in the new blood from the college uh, campuses, which is big big recruiting firm. A recruiting platform for us, you know, we're really looking through, you know, these these capabilities coming with them, but also bringing our our uh, millennials and Gen Zs to be really being at, looking at when they have the passion to look at new technology, embrace this new technology. But it's also important that it's not just the technology, but the, the strong understanding of the business processes, right? And the value proposition. So for us, it's very important to make sure that, you know, as we bring the skills and talents, we're also helping to, to blend with the, with the process transformation that's required, the culture transformation that's required in this space. So we're looking at all facets to make sure that this is a sustainable kind of a talent and it's not just application. We, in my organization, 
the work um, heavily with not only the, the big consulting firms, we work a lot with the startup companies because we know um, they generate a lot of great ideas in this space, um, different way of thinking. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that they are aware of with these companies like us and, and of course, like Kroger is looking and hopefully this, this, this forum helps a little bit, but really kind of focusing where the um, the value is and how way they put their, their investments to be able to drive that so they can partner with the bigger companies as well. So we look at all different facets in P&G, uh, from training folks internally, bringing new talent from colleges, um, mm -hmm. helping to make sure our process transformation, telling our, our the ecosystem of the startups we work in, what's our key challenges, we share that out very openly. Um, to make sure that it goes out in the industry and then we, we bring it back and look at you know what ideas are out there and how to solve it differently. And of course, with big partners like IBM as well um, so to make sure it's a solution based. That's great to hear when I hear, you know, so we're in Cleveland and two, two solid Ohio companies and being Ohio and myself, you know, I sit here and I think, you know, why, why not, and Jerry called out, you know, why not have a garage here, why not make Cleveland the, the focus? And I think this thought of talent, as I had a, a pleasure of sitting last night with the Jobs Ohio team um, over dinner, you know, talent is here, and we, we, what we're, we're seeing globally is that you know, there's this thought of blue collar and white collar jobs, and what, what we're talking about here, this, it's new collar, a, a, a term that we, we coined uh, a couple years back. It's, it's this new collar opportunity that doesn't necessarily take a, a, a graduate degree or maybe even a four-year degree. Um, and we have even, we now partner with uh, some of with people, uh, competitive companies, but technology companies with Microsoft and others, but we, we launch these P-Tech high schools where we have, you know, students who otherwise wouldn't go to a four-year uh, college, they're actually just, they're getting six years of high school. While they're doing it, they're getting an internship in technology and, and companies where we partner. Uh, I think we may be talking to P&G about this, but that talent is there. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, I don't have to be this huge data science to do blockchains, this mm -hmm. data scientist to do blockchain. I just have to have that creativeness, that want to, and that skill. And, and then another, another uh, shameless plug here as I work a, a lot with veterans. Matt with True Tickets was out here, uh, Navy. Uh, helicopter pilot, I forgive him because I'm an Army veteran. Uh, and Army will beat Navy this coming week in the Army-Navy game, if anyone was wondering. Um, I'm taking bets. <coughs> so our veterans are also highly motivated, the, the, the perfect types of, of thoughts of grabbing them and pulling them into the workforce because they already have the, the foundation for that, you know, uh, work hard, work mm -hmm. fast. Uh, if you're going to fail, fail fast and move forward. I got that from you, the whole fail fast and keep, keep going uh, fast forward. You know, those, those are other sources of talent. I think, especially when I think about Ohio, Ohio, California, uh, and Texas are, two, are three of the areas where, where we are rich with veterans uh, uh, with regards to opportunity. So, you know, I think that, that thought of talent and finding it, uh, yeah. it's, it's and, great. And, and that's a great question. I mean, and a great point, I should say. I don't want to fly to San Francisco every month either um, for a four-hour plane drive. So um, I am, we're, we are very much so, and I can speak for P&G, that we want to grow the local talent, be it Cincinnati, be it Cleveland, be it Columbus um, or Dayton. Um, we are very open to, you know, we, we, from my organization, we partnered with a lot of universities. We'll look at, you know, what's going on. Um, sometimes we send them projects just to get that talent going. It doesn't have to be top schools. It could be tech schools. Um, but I think it's, it's very important, and it's a, it's a big thing for us, even in Cincinnati, to be able to retain our local talent. We have great universities in this, in this area, be it, you know, Cleveland or, or Cincinnati or Columbus, and, um, you know, they're all flying out. To, to either east or the west, right? So, and I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll be in some of the startup companies and I'll talk to these kids and they'll say, yeah, I went to Miami University, Oxford, Cincinnati. I'm like, what? I have to come meet you here? <laughs> um, but so I think it's a, it's a great point. I think we also, I think to go, going back to you guys, um, Jason, and I don't know how you guys are thinking about it, but I think we want some of the bigger companies to be investing here as well, right? Exactly. It takes not just us, but it takes um, a group of companies to be really bringing that talent. Private, public, 
government, you, you pull all those, those yeah. players together, and that's the real ecosystem to get it started. So let's do this. Let's take in the last, in the last 10 minutes. I, I'd love to take some uh, questions, and I, I really should have, you know, my age kicks in. I'm going to stare at the screen here. We have some questions here. Um, what support do you need from leadership to use blockchain? Back to the thought of, you know, who owns it? How do you, how do you do that with your leadership? Yeah, um, I, can, I can start. Um, it's not the, the use, support to use of blockchain. Um, I would go back to, to saying that I think we need the leadership buy-in because it's a culture shift and it's a change in the way we're doing work. Um, and we need the leadership support to be able to um, break the barriers that would come across, either be in a partner of ecosystem or within the company, mm -hmm. the process change and the people. I think technology play, a lot of the leadership at from PNG, you know, blockchain is a cool hype word, but they're really looking at value. If you don't kind of share what the value is, you're not gonna get that support. But I think having them to embrace that change in culture and supporting us through that process, we cannot drive very fast and quick. And then the second thing is that, I mean, anything like any innovation, you know, to your earlier point, Jason, you have to try and you have to fail and it's okay. And a lot of the stuff I think uh, for the leadership to understand is as we're dabbling into some of these things, we're gonna win, we're gonna not win, and it's okay, but you have, we have to do that fast and quick and move on. Um, I think that's where I see the leadership and this is some, something we see in PNG um, heavily and that's why we're able to make a lot of progress as well. Yeah, so uh, for me, my job is to, to solve strategic problems for our business, and it doesn't really matter what the technical solution is. The technical solution needs to solve the business problem. Exactly. And I think the, the area that we're working in with you guys with Food Trust, blockchain is the perfect solution. Um, but in many cases, it feels like blockchain is a technology looking for a use case. And, uh, right. and to me, we just need to focus on what the business problem is and let the right technology come to play. So, so great, great point. We'll lead into a question that I, I see here on the screen. So if, if blockchain, you know, it's, uh, what was the, the, it, it's this great technology trying to mm -hmm. find something or a sandwich, you know, trying to find a picnic. You know, if that's the case, you know, then how could blockchain potentially help other technologies? How can it be a, a catalyst for advanced analytics uh, or data or IOT? Some of the, that's what the question is here. Yeah, so I think with uh, IOT, particularly with what we're doing in the supply chain, cold chain is a huge, huge opportunity for us. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a food scientist, but I know that as, as our food moves through throughout our value chain, if we can prove out what the temperature range of strawberries, for instance, are throughout the, uh, the shipping process, we can actually keep it on our shelves longer. Um, so I IoT, I think, is going to be a huge enabler that's going to sit on top of the blockchain and will, uh, will allow us to ensure that our fruit is, uh, food is safer longer. So what do you think, uh, one of the questions here is wh how can uh, the educational organizations get involved in some of the opportunities that, that you're talking about here? How, how might they take advantage of this uh, in, in collaboration with you? Yeah, I think um, uh, one of the things I would start with uh, from some of the educational institutions is to partner with companies like us to bring real use cases or, um, you know, they're working on test thesis, whatever, to work on real problems. I think that brings in a good knowledge base as these um, the students are going into the real world, into the real job, they understand it's not just the technology, but how technology can play. Um, you know, we at PNG, my organization in PNG, partners with a lot of universities, startups, you know, different different places. And if anybody's interested to bring some good talent, um, we're open to partner with you guys to be able to share some of those ideas uh, back into into the um, into the ecosystem of the educational system. Okay. And, and Steve, the question here, you mentioned some challenges you had with the data. One of the questions we have is, can you expand on some of the challenges you've had with data uh, in trying to work through the supply chain? Uh, so I still don't have the right data. Um, <laughs> the, you know, it's, a, it's really a journey for us. Um, what I've seen is, is the business is really remarkable and the business finds a way to run. Yeah. Um, but when, when you start moving across business units, that's where, at least in, in our case, we've, we've experienced some, some opportunities. 
Um, and then going even a step further and uh, start talking about, okay, not only are we gonna, gonna send data from silo to silo within our organization, but we also need to ensure that it aligns with, uh, with some of our uh, CPGs and providers that we're working with. So um, that's really what I'm gonna be do doing in 2019 and beyond is figuring out, okay, between manufacturing and supply chain and loyalty, how do I get this data to move smoothly, not only throughout our enterprise, but also connected with partners like, like P&G as well. So it's, uh, the data is a journey, and in my opinion, probably one of the biggest challenges that larger companies are gonna face as we look to adopting blockchain more ubiquitously. Okay, so another question, if, if and I'll pose this to you as we were talking about uh, the ecosystem, Asante. If you're a founder of a company, if you've started a, a startup, how would you advise the, those startup companies to engage with the larger companies? How do they make contact in the context of blockchain? Um, so with, I can speak for P&G. Um, we actually have a really good open ecosystem that we work with uh, VCs and startups. Um, we very periodically send out um, different, what we call the um, briefs for our um, challenges. Um, and then we actually meet up um, multiple times a year with, um, with the different companies around. We actually also deliberately challenge the bigger and the smaller companies to, to come back with the same challenge response to see. You know, most often we get very creative ideas, you know, where you don't expect it to be, but then we take that and we partner with them to be able to enable them to take it to the next level. We know that, you know, when smaller startups in coming up with ideas, um, they can achieve everything on their own. They have to partner with somebody like us where we have the real issues or the real problems that they can work in a real environment and, you know, be it data, be it whatever, and each of these startups have different investments levels too, right? Um, so I think that's the best way for them to engage um, with the companies and understanding. And not every company had this model. I know um, P&G's NGS model, which is the next generation, is a very unique model. We operate as an external company. We op operate to a point of... Uh, working very, very well with the smaller ecosystems, but really bringing some of the disruptive ideas. If the ideas are not disruptive, then there's no value. So if, if the startups and, and, and they're looking through where they want to play, think about how you think this disruption is going to be a 10x value or a 5x value. If not, you're competing with the the other solutions in the market and you know why use one when something is already there. So we are always looking, or at least my organization is always looking for um, the companies that are bringing unique solutions, unique ideas, and then we will help them take it to the next level. And so when we talk about these uh, other players, one of the questions that was up here is that if you're a Walmart or a Kroger, you know, how do you get players in the, the value chain to play with you without just saying, play with me or we're not gonna play with you? How do, how do you, you sort of alluded to this thought of value. I mean, how do you get them in, in the game if it's a team sport? I think uh, for us it's partnership and, and to some degree, there's a little bit of bullying, I mean, to be honest. But, but it, it, it is, especially in the food Bully safety Bully to value. Arena. That's right, that's right. Um, but our better partners are going to, going to want to play ball with us. Um, because as, as we see things move throughout the value chain, our better partners are going to be able to move things faster. Supply chain will be able to move faster. And uh, that's just going to add value for them as well as for us. And I think it's, it's change. You know, we'll, We'll close out here. We're about to uh, have to have to come to a stop, and I, I want to use this point as the closing point. This thought of change, because there was a question about legal and does legal get involved. And it's funny because we, every legal firm that either is with clients that we work with or that are you know somewhere in the framing, they've said that it's taken twice as long as they expect. It's cost twice as much, mm -hmm. right? And what they've found is that. No one likes that. The legal, legal firm, even though they're getting paid more, like, look, I, that's double. You know, we don't want that type of expectation. So change. Change is always difficult. Yep. But then on the other end, this thought of bullying, you know, sometimes you have to nudge. So mm -hmm. I'll change it to nudging, nudging to get them out. This is just another change. It's a change for the good. And so when we, we, we sit here and we look at what we have in Cleveland, it's, it, Cleveland is ready for change. 
Everyone here in the audience is making that change. You have a wonderful catalyst with Bernie and the rest of the leadership team that have said, we're ready to change. We're going to create this great thing called block land. Everyone's going to come together. And so here we are. So with that, I want to thank all of you for a moment of your morning with us to have a conversa conversation, a shared conversation, and thank the, the entire Blockland uh, event and group uh, for having us here. And thanks for uh, the privilege to sit here with wonderful doers, the actual leaders of blockchain here. Thank you. Have a great rest of the morning.